If you've ever blown bubbles, you've probably seen multiple bubbles connect into one. If you happen to participate in bubble stacking competitions, you'll be very familiar with this. Currently, the world record for longest chain of bubbles is at 87. Now, if you pull out your bubble wand and try to break this record, you'll quickly realize that it's really hard to stack even a few bubbles like this. The reason that it's so hard is because this is not a stable configuration of bubbles. The bubbles want to do something else. You might not know what rules a stable bubble follows, but you've definitely seen them before. We all know that when two bubbles combine, they don't look like this, or this, or this, or this. A double bubble looks like this. The soap films are parts of a sphere, and although you probably haven't measured it before, I think this should make sense when I say it, when the three spheres intersect at an edge, they meet at 120 degree angles, or equal angles. This is the standard double bubble. Nature's been doing this for way longer than we've been around. But did you know that we didn't prove this until the year 2000? And that was only for two bubbles. There are still, to this day, many unanswered math problems about clusters of soap bubbles. In this video, we're going to learn about the physics of bubbles. We're going to learn why single bubbles are spheres, and we're going to learn rules for determining the shape of a bubble cluster. The driving force that allows bubbles to exist is surface tension. Although I use force in an English way and not a physics way, surface tension actually has units of force per length. While preparing for this video, it occurred to me that throughout my entire education, I just took surface tension for granted, as a fact. We learned about it in biology class, but we didn't learn why it happens, and I definitely never learned about it in a physics class, even though it's clearly physics. And I think the reason for that is surface tension is really easy to misunderstand, so teachers kind of ignore it. If you have had surface tension explained to you, it probably went something like this. Water molecules are attracted to each other, so a molecule in the middle of a drop will be pulled in all directions and have a net force of zero. But a molecule on the surface will have more water below it and none above, so it gets pulled towards the rest of the water. Even though this argument hits some good points, there are major problems with it. For one, if the water molecules near the surface have a net force inward, then why aren't they accelerating? If there's never any force to oppose it, then every water drop should just collapse into a black hole. The other problem is that this doesn't explain the main feature of surface tension that we're usually interested in, especially for bubbles. The force that's parallel to the surface. The force that makes the surface act like a drumhead or a rope. That's what tension usually means. Where does this come from? A water molecule is more attracted to another molecule the closer they get, but when they get really close, they repel. Because the repulsive force acts on short distances, it's the same in all directions, even really close to the surface. But it does increase when the density is higher, because there are more neighboring molecules within that range on average. That means that the repulsive force decreases near the surface. The attractive force, on the other hand, isn't that affected by depth because far away molecules can still contribute. The total effect is that the attractive force minus the repulsive force is higher closer to the surface. That's why the surface of water tends to pull itself tight. Every molecule on the surface is pulling on its neighbors, but there are all of these other molecules inside that can't just disappear, so water attempts to minimize surface area for a given volume. Of course, you can't really blow bubbles with water. Water does such a good job of minimizing surface area, the surface tension is so high, that if there's any air, it'll figure out a way to squeeze it out and form a water drop instead of a bubble. That's why we add soap. Soap is a surfactant, a chemical that reduces the surface tension of water. A soap molecule has two sides, one that's hydrophilic, it likes water, and one that's hydrophobic, it doesn't mix well with water, just like oil. This means that when you mix soap with water, it naturally organizes itself so that the water molecules are on the inside, touching the hydrophilic part, and then there's a layer of soap molecules on either side. Things that are oily will naturally sort themselves into the hydrophobic side, and then if a bubble forms, they'll be trapped. That's why soap is good at cleaning. What it also means is that if there's air on the inside, the soap water will still try to minimize surface area, but the layers will keep it from collapsing into a drop. Lowering the surface tension makes longer lasting bubbles. So now we have a simple, beautiful rule that all bubbles have to follow. Their shape has to minimize surface area. 
And for a single volume, we already know what that shape is. It's a sphere. Bubbles around. Common sense tells us that a sphere in 3D, or a circle in 2D, has the lowest ratio of surface area to volume. If you try out a few shapes, like a square, a triangle, a hexagon, you'll find that they all have a higher perimeter than a circle. But there are a lot of shapes out there, so how can we know that a circle is the best? Even though it feels right, it's not that easy to prove. Right off the bat, we can eliminate any shape that's concave. If a shape is concave, then we can make another shape by taking its convex hull, or the smallest convex shape that contains it. This new shape is guaranteed to have a smaller perimeter and a bigger area, so we've already narrowed our answer down to something that's convex. To narrow it down further, let's use a method called Steiner symmetrization. Start with an arbitrary shape, then cut it into infinitely thin slices, all parallel to some axis. Then take each slice and slide it until it's centered with the other ones. Once you've done this to the entire shape, the area of this new one is exactly the same as the original, but the perimeter will be smaller because you balanced out the edges of these infinitely thin trapezoids. So if a shape isn't symmetric, you can use this to make another shape that has the same area with a smaller perimeter. If you try this on a circle, nothing changes because it's already symmetric in every direction. So if there's a shape that has the smallest perimeter for a given area, it must be a circle. Now, there's a subtle problem with this logic, so subtle that Steiner himself didn't even realize it when other mathematicians pointed it out to him after he published this argument. We have not proven that a circle minimizes perimeter for a given area. All we did is find a way to make the perimeter of every shape except for a circle smaller. Similarly, I can think of a way to make every natural number except for 1 bigger. It's called squaring it. But that does not mean that 1 is the biggest number, because there is no biggest number. If a biggest number did exist though, it would have to be 1 because anything else we can make bigger. In order to make a complete proof that a circle minimizes perimeter, we would need to also prove that a shape with minimum perimeter exists. This was done several decades after Steiner in 1884, but what I showed you is the fun part. You can probably imagine how we can extend this argument to higher dimensions. A circle minimizes perimeter for a given area, and a sphere minimizes surface area for a given volume. That's the reason why single bubbles are round. So what happens when you have more than one pocket of air that needs to be enclosed by soap? There are a few rules that we've noticed that soap film follows. These are called Plateau's Laws. One is that each part of the film has constant mean curvature. In most cases, this means a sphere or a plane, but there are other interesting shapes too. Most notably, a soap film between two rings will form a catenoid. Another rule is one that I told you earlier when I introduced the double bubble. The edges of three soap films meet at 120 degree angles. If multiple edges meet together at a point, they always meet in fours, like a tetrahedron, or about 109 degrees. These rules seem to apply to anything from a double bubble, to wires dipped in soap, to a foam with millions of microscopic bubbles. Although Plateau came up with these rules in the 19th century, they weren't proven until 1976. Even after this impressive development, soap bubble theory still had a long way to go. In 1993, a group of undergraduates proved the double bubble theorem in two dimensions, then it was proven in three dimensions in the year 2000. A closely related problem is the case for infinite bubbles that all have the same area in two dimensions, in other words, a honeycomb. The fact that a honeycomb is the lowest perimeter way to arrange a number of volumes wasn't proven until 2001. Just last year, in 2022, mathematicians proved the triple bubble problem in three dimensions and higher. Let me make that clear. Until last year, we were not sure what shape three combined soap bubbles are supposed to be. Why is this so hard to prove? Well, one of the best tools that we have for solving optimization problems that have a curve or a surface as the answer is calculus of variations, especially using the Euler-Lagrange equation. Solving this differential equation can give you a curve that minimizes or maximizes something. But a differential equation can't give you a solution that's not differentiable, so variational calculus can't handle surfaces with edges or singularities like a cube or even a double bubble. We need to be able to consider surfaces whether they're smooth or not. 
In order to do that, mathematicians came up with the pretty recent field of geometric measure theory. Jean Taylor's 1976 proof of Plateau's laws was one of the first big successes of this field. I feel bad just listing off recent proofs of bubble cluster related theorems without walking you through them, but unfortunately they're just too hard for a YouTube video and I really don't understand them to begin with. I hope I've given you enough meat, enough things to think about, but if not, please check out some of my sources in the description. My more mathematical viewers might enjoy Frank Morgan's geometric measure theory. I was tricked by a beginner's guide. Bees have been making honeycomb for, what, millions of years? And yet not once has a bee sat down and proved that hexagons are the most efficient solution. They just know. You would think that something in the physical world that seems to be common sense, like honeycomb, or the shape of a bubble, or the shape of two bubbles, would come from an easy, fundamental mathematical fact. But I hope that this video has demonstrated to you that that's really not the case. Even when we understand the physical laws that a system follows, the math is sometimes overwhelmingly hard. In the case of bubbles, we really have a lot of work to do. So please, whenever you see bubbles, enjoy their mathematical perfection. I'd like to thank my Patreon members for supporting this video. I recently launched my Patreon page along with Words for the Birds, a monthly zine that features illustrated content from scripts that never made it into videos. If you want access to that, or if you just enjoy the videos I make, uh, consider helping me out. It always surprises me how well these videos are received, so thank you for watching this far.